Good afternoon to all of you who are participating in our second day of uh, Reconnect's final conference. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, um, so many of you, uh, to the conference which has already started uh, yesterday with the first day where basically the Reconnect's first results were shared with a very wide audience um, on the topic of the rule of law, rule of law backsliding, but as the discussions revealed, obviously democratic backsliding in the European Union um, overall. We also saw yesterday already first recommendations coming from uh, Reconnect uh, Horizon 2020 project, which is coming to its end uh, this April. And that has been focusing on the rule of law and democracy uh, throughout of its lifetime. The recommendations put forward, you can also find on our website and actually also tomorrow, if you should be in Brussels at the live event, the third day of the conference, uh, which takes place in the University Foundation in Brussels. Today's um, second day of Reconnect's final conference is entitled Democratic Renewal for a More Resilient European Union. It is my great pleasure uh, to this um, end to welcome so many of our colleagues who have participated in the project over the last four years, but also colleagues from other universities, practitioners which have followed us uh, throughout the project. This afternoon will be dedicated again um, to the findings and also the recommendations that project, the Reconnect project is putting forward in order to find ways and to formulate recommendations for a more democratic European Union, how to overcome a uh, democracy in retreat, one may argue. In fact, uh, there is a lot going on in the European Union, as you obviously know, and uh, we will definitely talk about many of the challenges to democracy during our panels uh, this afternoon, but also the ongoing reflections in the conference on the future of Europe and its uh, potential outcomes that we should expect later this year. Very uh, quickly going through the program of this afternoon, I would like to uh, basically tell you that we are kicking off with a keynote uh, by Caroline uh, de Reuter, and I will uh, come to her a little bit closer in my opening remarks, uh, followed uh, by the first reconnect findings and recommendations and treaty changes to strengthen democracy in Europe by Ben Kroom and Sylvia Kritzinger, respectively, from the University of Amsterdam and the University of Vienna. Afterwards, uh, we will have a very interesting and very large uh, setup of colleagues, international uh, well-known colleagues, to talk about looking ahead towards a more democratic EU, a panel discussion with Claudia Schell Schalich from the OECD uh, Deliberative Toolbox Unit, Peter de Wilde from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, Christina Landfried, Thomas Mann Fellow 2022, University of Hamburg, Claudia Landwehr from the University of Mainz, Julian Navarro from Lille Catholic University, Tom Tens from Leiden University, Oliver Tribe from the University of Münster, again moderated by Ben Kroon and Sylvia Kritzinger. Now, I would like uh, to basically introduce the keynote of this afternoon to kick, out, kick off our discussions on uh, democracy in the European Union. In fact, uh, the keynote uh, speech will be uh, given by Caroline de Reuter. Um, Caroline de Reuter is a journalist and lecturer uh, based in Brussels. She is a European affairs correspondent and columnist for the leading Dutch newspaper NRC Handelsblatt and a regular contributor to foreign policy, EU observer and the standard. Uh, she spent more than 20 years 
uh, covering Europe, the European Union, European integration from different corners um, of Europe, uh, based in Oslo, based in Vienna and Brussels. And recently she has covered uh, not only Brexit, COVID-19, but also and obviously the war in Ukraine as turning points of European integration. Now, her latest book actually is called uh, Beter Wot het niet in reis door de Europese Unie en het Hauptbote Rijk. Uh, literally translated, um, it will not get better a journey through the European Union and the Habsburg Empire. Um, in the book, she is asking, and I quote literally from her website, um, uh, whether we should finally accept the Union as it is, a benign empire of sorts and permanent change unfinished by definition. And it is on that last note that Caroline de Goethe will address us this afternoon with her keynote lessons from Habsburg for a resilient democratic EU. Perhaps counterintuitive at first sight, we are very much looking forward to your reflections on what the Habsburg Empire can tell us about democracy in the European Union. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, it's very nice to be here today at this conference. Um, there, there are many names and faces of people um, I know and whose work uh, I am familiar with. So um, humbled to be here with you. So yes, I'm going to talk about democracy and resilience uh, in Europe. Um, and as you have understood already, I'm going to do this in a rather non-academic, um, and slightly more impressionistic, uh, unorthodox way. These are reflections about democracy and resilience in Europe. Uh, because Europeans often complain that Europe is not democratic enough, that it is too bureaucratic, too difficult and too slow. And so they want to change it. And I think this is great. Because wouldn't it be nice, you know, if Europe would be more democratic, more transparent, more understandable for everybody, and uh, more efficient as well? I think no one would say no to that. Still, I argue uh, that playing for time, delaying things, avoiding conflict, uh, working on never ending reforms, and producing ugly, unreadable, and long compromises are, to a large extent, uh, in my view, what makes the EU tick. Uh, or maybe we should even um, uh, not call it the EU, but Europe, because in a way, Norway and Switzerland and, and many others are, are, are part of this uh, permanent process. Um, so while we must be ambitious in Europe, I'm all for it. We must, I argue, also be careful not to expect too much all the time. And um, I, 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 I got this insight from having uh, lived in Vienna. I lived in Vienna for four years between 2013 and 2017. As you know, it's the former capital of the Habsburg Empire. And there, to my surprise, I must say, I discovered that people in the empire, and I focus mostly on the last 100, 150 years, uh, grossly, um, people in the empire, they were also complaining all the time, just like we are, about everything being too slow, too complicated, too difficult, and everybody being too divided. Um, but by, by kicking the can down the road and by muddling through. Uh, they, they used to call it Fort Worstel. Um, the successive emperors managed to keep many nations and language groups more or less safe and sound uh, under one roof for about 600 years, if you really stretch it from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and 
it was much less autocratic, the Habsburg Empire, than surrounding rivals like Russia, Prussia, uh, the Ottoman Empire, or France. So I started to wonder while living in and working in Vienna, what, what are actually the similarities between the EU and the Habsburg Empire? Is there something we can learn from these Habsburgers? Can um, the EU's weaknesses actually also be uh, an asset? Huh? And should, should we finally accept that the EU cannot be perfect? It's just impossible uh, that it is, and that it is unfinished uh, per definition. So all this uh, was discussed in, in, in my book, which became a bestseller in, in the Netherlands, to our a big surprise, actually, in the middle of a lockdown. And by now, there are four translations on the way, and the first will be uh, the German one, which comes out early June. So. Um, how I got the idea to compare the two empires, you can read that more extensively uh, in, in my paper, which, which we will put on the site of this conference. And, uh, but here I will explain very briefly. Um, it started in 2016. As you know, that was the year of Trump and the year of Brexit, or rather the reverse, Brexit and Trump. And um, I had just spent 10 years uh, in Brussels covering multiple crises, like the financial crisis and the euro crisis. Uh, 2016 was also was the year where uh, a far right uh, politician in Austria almost became president. Um, and people, um, people were saying, Geert Wilders is going to win the elections in the Netherlands in 2017, and Le Pen will become president of France. So there was a rather gloomy atmosphere at the time, and people were uh, reading again the Welt von Gestern, the, 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 the wonderful uh, memoirs by Stefan Zweig. And they started to ask me, since I was in Vienna, can the EU end up like the Habsburg Empire? And they meant, of course, can it explode or implode? <laughs> and I thought, well, this is a good question, uh, but I had no idea what the answer was. And because I'm a Western European uh, and Western Europeans at school, they get everything about transatlantic relations, um, uh, NATO, a little bit of Germany and France. And that's for most of us, mostly it. Uh. Um, so I didn't know anything about the Habsburg Empire, and I really had to study it. For me, it was, it was a totally different world. But what I learned during these Viennese years uh, and afterwards when I kept working on it, actually gradually changed the way I looked at the EU. Because debates about Europe are often framed, in my view, by unrealistic expectations. On the one hand, you have the federalists uh, who are always disappointed in, in, in the EU, in Europe, because it has, it has no power, they, they say. On the other hand of the debate, you have the nationalists for whom whatever happens, the EU is too powerful. Um, but both sides of the argument are then constantly disappointed. Um, but of course, you know it and I know it too, in reality, um, it's not so clear cut. Sometimes the EU is very powerful, for instance, in trade or agriculture. And sometimes it is utterly uh, powerless. Uh, for instance, uh, as we see now with the war in, in Ukraine, in foreign policy and security policy. So could it be that the EU, as it is, half-baked, sometimes underperforming, sometimes really powerful, is all we're going to get. Well, I think so. And let me, let me highlight some of the parallels now. Um, contrary to the EU, of course, the Habsburg Empire was a state. It had one army and one foreign policy, which we don't have. Uh, and as I said, democracy back then with, with the powerful Kaiser, was obviously not how, how we perceive democracy now. Um, 
So those are the different obvious differences. There are also some obvious similarities, uh, like uh, both having a single market, a common currency, being a bureaucracy and a rule of law. And I won't go into these obvious uh, similarities either. I picked out seven parallels that more or less touch on uh, democracy and resilience, which are the themes for today. Um, first parallel, the empire provided a roof over the heads of several nations and language groups who were always jealous of one another and seldom agreed on, you know, whatever. In a way, it's like the 27 now. Each of them have their own traditions, uh, taboos, uh, history, cultural uh, specialties, wishes and demands. And they come to Brussels to fight it out and to find a compromise. So um, under the EU roof, because it's also a roof of many groups and nations, they fight with words, uh, not with ammunition any longer. And this is why they're always so divided, uh, why the compromises are so ugly often, and why they are so slow. All this takes time. This one roof is the first parallel. The second, what the Habsburg rulers did, basically, is provide security for all. They kept the bigger nations in check, uh, so they wouldn't attack each other, uh, and they're they're they were protecting uh, the small ones from being overrun by the big ones. And exactly the same thing is happening uh, in the EU. The third parallel, the Habsburg Empire was always keen on compromises, like we are now uh, in the EU. Everybody must own the entire process and must own the decisions to a, to a large extent, at least. So uh, the, in the Habsburg Empire, they try to avoid, um, like us now, having one clear loser or one clear winner. The idea is, uh, and they don't always succeed, but they really, they, they really try to, um, is that everybody gets something out of it. And this is why they have endless negotiations and they're constantly massaging things in in all the corners um, of Europe. Um, I recently read something about Maria Theresia, the, uh, the uh, empress, and she already feared exits by uh, groups or nations in the far corners of the empire. Rival powers were constantly trying to peel off uh, uh, these groups. And she, uh, she reasoned that if I don't consult them uh, enough, and if I don't offer them services like healthcare and education, um, in the end, the osmosis, maybe across the border, will become too strong and I will lose them. So uh, she, she, although the system, I can't emphasize this enough, is, it was different than the system we, we, that we have, um, the, the considerations and, and, and many practicalities were actually surprisingly similar. Parallel number four, like the EU, uh, the Habsburg Empire was in, in, in a perfect, in a per permanent uh, negotiation with itself and within itself. It was constantly reforming and changing the existing arrangements with uh, the nations. And this was often pushed by popular demand or by external events or by both. And also because I think in complex systems, one reform tends to make other reforms necessary. So once the ball is rolling, you can't stop it any longer. Um, so both empires, if I may call them that, I will not go into it now, but I raised the question in my book, is the EU an empire? Anyway, both empires were, are completely obsessed with themselves. They're navel gazers. Every time something happens, the delicate balance between of the different groups is upset. So the first move is then to try to rebalance. We do this and the Habsburg Empire was exactly like that. Um, 
in order to keep uh, to keep the peace among the groups and the nations, uh, both are channeling disagreements to a to a settlement. Um, so I repeat, these are internal uh, projects. They do not, or or, or very rarely, initiate uh, things. They mostly react. As an example of an external trigger, you can think of the virus, for instance, and uh, common uh, European vaccine procurement, which otherwise we would never have uh, if the virus would not have prompted it. And an internal uh, trigger um, is the demand for more democracy, for instance. And this is why we had the uh, conference on, on the future of Europe. Um, Parallel number five, both are so-called interstitial powers surrounded by large rivals. So both are feeling constantly militarily exposed uh, and weak as well, because you never know where the next uh, blow is coming from. The Habsburgers, very interestingly, they had uh, they they worked with buffer zones just outside the external borders to keep themselves safer, and you know perhaps also in the hope that if there would be um, a blow, they could fight it out in the buffer zone instead of inside the empire. They also um, made sure always to have alliances with some mighty neighbors that if they were attacked from one side, they could, they could uh, call others uh, for help, military help as well. And of course, the EU is also using buffers. Uh, think of the EU neighborhood policy. Um, think in a, in a certain way also of, of, of Ukraine. Uh, Russia is waging war on the West in some kind of a buffer as well, unfortunately. Um, another example of an alliance with the neighbor is, for instance, the Turkey deal on, on um, migration and refugees. Parallel number six, um, both are perfecting the art of avoiding conflict to the utmost and gaining time, delaying things. This is the famous Fort Vorstrom, which was really the cornerstone of Habsburg uh, policy especially in the end. Um, I think the term was first coined by a prime minister called Taf in the 1870s, but if Jean-Claude Juncker would have said it a few years ago, Fort, Fort Worstel, then um, uh, everybody could have imagined it too. And lastly, there are many more, but um, I, I will stick to seven today. Uh, lastly, uh, the last parallel is and that really, that one really struck me. Um, the Habsburg Empire permanently felt insecure. It suffered from a very low uh, self-esteem. And the same, of course, is happening with the EU. Every time we draw up a new policy in Europe, uh, everybody's cynical. Ah, we will never manage. It will be a disaster, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have, just like in the Habsburg days, an intellectual elite that is hypercritical and to a certain extent cynical even. And uh, while in Vienna reading all these works of Josef Roth and Karl Kraus and Stefan Zweig and Schnitzler and all of them, I thought maybe it's no coincidence that, that these, their books feel so modern to us us today. You know, it's like reading an FT uh, commentator on what's going on in Europe. Now, what do we do with those parallels? Is there a lesson? I think so, yes. Um, Europe has had many crises in recent years. I mean, everybody has had many crises, and Europe had them too. And you and I, we all studied those crises, of course, uh, extensively. Um, and I, I used to cover all these Brexit, all these Brussels summits, uh, well, on Brexit as well. Um, and they were all labeled make or break summits, existential summits. Um, does the EU still exist tomorrow? That kind of questions you, you, uh, they were trying to answer in the newspapers. 
And I covered all these crises. And I remember, of course, the, the panic and the drama, but I also remember something else. I remember that each time European leaders arrived at the precipice, looked down and saw how deep it was down there, they moved back and compromised. Why? I think there's only one conclusion. They wanted the EU to survive. Um, the crisis uh, transformed the EU in a way, especially the recent crisis. Many national leaders, you know, whatever their rhetorics, realize by now that you can't weather international storms uh, alone. Even Marine Le Pen has scrapped her Frexit plans. Um, she and others began to see in a world dominated by messy um, rivalries, that the EU, with all its faults and its flaws that we all agree on, I guess, also provides sovereignty. Just it doesn't only take them, it also gives some of it back. In Vienna, I realized that the Habsburg Empire had a similar function. There were many nationalities under, under that roof. The arrangement was not ideal for anyone. Everybody was complaining all the time. They always wanted and, and tried to, to, to use pretexts to get a better deal. But at the same time, each nation and each group got more than enough out of it to justify staying in and to keep investing. And this is why, in the end, I believe that they managed uh, to survive together for 600 years in, in different shapes and, and different forms, just like we are changing shapes and forms all the time. It wasn't perfect, uh, far from it, uh, but all were aware this was the deal, no more, no less. And sometimes I wish that in, in, in Europe today, we would be a little bit more realistic too. Now, um, my time is almost up, but of course I should answer that question. Can the EU end up like the Habsburg Empire? Uh, so I will do it very briefly. Um, for me, it was actually a discovery that the empire unraveled, not because of nationalism, as we all learned at school, but because of the First World War. When the war broke out, people were queuing up everywhere uh, to, to fight for the Kaiser. So there was very little um, uh, existential uh, skepticism or separatism or whatever. Um, but the outbreak of the war changed everything. Uh, most resources, first of all, went straight to the front, which was long and it didn't go well there. So food went there, uh, money went there, uh, mater material went there. And the state stopped slowly, slowly taking care uh, of the people. People lost their jobs. Many were on the payroll of the state, from teachers to street sweepers in all the corners of the empire. Um, they lost their livelihoods and they lost family members. There was also hunger in the cities, uh, in Vienna, for instance. And then very quickly, the Czechs started blaming the Hungarians of, of keeping food for, for themselves, and the Hungarians started blaming the Slovenes and so on. Um, and also all reforms, which had been too little and too late and so on, but were still taking place, all reforms were, were, were stopped. Parliament was closed. Political rights, uh, for instance, the right to strike, the right to have demonstrations, with the, which they all had, uh, they were all cancelled because all the noses had to be uh, in the same direction because of the war. And only then, when the state stopped offering added value to citizens, many turned to the nationalists whose solutions uh, they never trusted before, except maybe in terms of political rights, voting rights, for instance, and cultural rights, like having literature and education in your own language, for instance. So the EU, yes, I think so, the EU can uh, end up like the Habsburg Empire. But the danger 
in my view, is not so much nationalism, as many seem to think, but rather the conditions in which uh, the nationalists can thrive, like hunger, destruction, um, and hostilities. So let me leave it. Let me leave it here with my um, reflections on on on, on some uh, parts of democracy and resilience in Europe. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline de Reuter, for these uh, reflections on the parallels, the similarities, the differences between the Habsburg Empire and the European Union, but also which lessons um, the European Union, or rather we as citizens of and in the European Union, uh, can uh, take uh, from such a comparison between the Habsburg Empire and the European Union. Um, I. Uh, see that uh, we have opened uh, the, um, the the questions and answers so I ask also the audience to come in and ask your questions um, in the Q a uh, section uh, so that we can pass them on to uh, Caroline de Reuter. Um, in the meantime, uh, while we are waiting for the first um, uh, questions to to come in, I would like to, um, perhaps address myself very briefly the question to you, um, um, Caroline, whether um, from your uh, perspective, your analysis, uh, since we are talking about uh, the EU as a democratic EU and the question to which extent could democracy actually provide us with more resilience uh, in the context of the EU, uh, to which you would actually, from your analysis and your perspective, say, well, perhaps the EU should not. Uh, I understand from your uh, reflections that the European Union should not uh, try to go too much into a direction which it may not itself be able to fulfill. But what leads this uh, to democracy? How can we actually make uh, the European Union more democratic? And while I've asked these questions, two uh, colleagues have come in and uh, I will briefly give them the floor as well and add to my question. So um, I have uh, Christina Landfried and Ben Kroom as well, who raised their hands. Christine, please come in. Well, thank you very much uh, for this, I think, fascinating uh, keynote, Caroline de Kreuter, uh, which really had very many interesting points to think about. Uh, but isn't the difference if we look to Austria and all the seven parallels which you have shown us to us, the real difference is that we have democracy. And when you sort of say, well, we change all the time, it's always unfinished, we make compromises, it's sort of, you know, it's never perfect, of course, it's always muddling through, that in the end, in not just the, criti the critics, which might be, we are all belonging to the critics, but also the people say, we, we want to have a say in that. We don't want just to have piecemeal changes all the time from crisis to crisis. The structure of government is changing. We don't discuss it in public. And uh, with the current conference on the future of Europe, you see that people want to have a voice in that. So isn't the real difference that, of course, Austria had a king and it might not have been as autocratic as surrounding countries, as you rightly said, like Russia, but still it was not a democracy. And doesn't this make the real difference that also people are not really thinking that it's okay as it is? Thank you very much. It was really, uh, I think, uh, uh, gave us a lot of food for thought. Ben, please come in. I'm, uh, I'm afraid uh, my question has already been asked, but, but I will try to rephrase <laughs> it in a way. Uh, but thanks so much, Caroline, for this uh, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, and of course, it's, uh, yeah, it's tempting to, to kind of uh, question the historical parallels, but let's go with them. But, but for me, what was most striking was that you said, um, in the end, um, national leaders uh, want the EU to survive. But I guess with Korea and with Christine, my question is also, is survival 
Is that all they need? Is that all they, they want? Or is there, isn't there something more? Do they also want the EU to, well, to thrive or to improve or mm. indeed maybe to democratize or to become stronger? Uh, what do they want? Is survival enough? Uh, I don't think that survival will make us last 600 years. If that's <laughs> Okay. Caroline, there is a lot on the table. What do you want to take these questions? Um, well, uh, um, let me let me briefly uh, answer them. I think um, yes, our democracy, Christine, is uh, totally different from from uh, what the Habsburg Empire had. But while talking to experts. Um, because I started out like Alice in Wonderland, right, in Austria. Uh, but I talked to many people who, who studied the, the Habsburg Empire all their lives almost. And reading up uh, a lot of books, it struck me actually how benign and how democratic, maybe more informally uh, democratic, um, uh, the empire was. Uh, it was, you know, the story that we, history is also always written by um, the winners. Huh? So the story that I grew up with about uh, the Habsburg Empire is that people, uh, they didn't want to live under the thumb of the, uh, of the autocratic ruler any longer. Huh? And then, you know, it's like Wilson's uh, 14 points. Um, and but while while reading up, I understood. I mean, they had uh, syndicates. They could uh, they could uh, they could organize strikes. They, they were demonstrations all the way through Vienna all the time and other cities as well. Um, there was a profound discord. For instance, one of the parallels uh, then and now is about the, the behavior of the of the Hungarians. Uh, the Hungarians, extremely contraire right now in the EU, they behaved exactly the same way in the Habsburg Empire. But they were listened to, their voices counted, uh, they kept the budget very low. <laughs> um, you know, so the, it, the, it surprised me to a certain extent how much, and again, I don't focus on the first 500 years, but rather the last 100. To me, it was quite a surprise how how they proceeded and yes it was maybe not not fast enough and 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 but um, again there was a demand for more but there was no demand for exits or uh, to have the whole thing uh, exploded and i i didn't know this had been the case so i think it is rather comparable the conference on the future of europe uh, what I'm, I think it's 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 a great thing that we did this and we should do it again, but we should do it better because I was a little bit worried this time, but I'm sure you will go into it later. I was a little bit worried that um, people were working on citizens were working on treaty changes and all that while um, they would they would they would never get them because governments don't want treaty changes. So what is the use of, of throwing bones at people, uh, promising them uh, you know, the moon, and then uh, closing the conference and saying, okay, very nice you, that you, all you guys participated in this experiment and we learned a lot from you and now we're going to do uh, our usual thing, you know, no treaty change, uh, thank you very much. And this is how you disappoint people. This is how you raise expectations without ever fulfilling them. Yeah. Uh, ben, um, I think for a lot of leaders, survival is not all they want. But about the rest, they don't agree. You know, if you ask an Estonian, what is the biggest challenge in Europe today? The, his answer will be different than when you ask a Belgian or or a Portuguese or a Greek. Huh? And this is also, this is, I think, why we are so reactive. This is why we don't initiate much because we love to initiate things, but uh, one wants, wants to jump in this direction and the other one wants to jump in another reaction. It is only when it becomes urgent, like with va vaccine procurement. I think this is a great example. Nobody wanted this, um, but, it, and then they realize that you know we, we will not manage to get it done when we 
when we all do it individually. Then France and Germany will have the first vaccines and Luxembourg and, 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 and Slovenia and, and, and Slovakia will have to wait for six, six months, which means lots of jealousies, uh, everybody angry, borders closed, and uh, you know, it, 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 a, a huge political problem for Europe. So that's why they did it. So I think often they only act, uh, they want more, but the problem is they don't want the same. <laughs> Uh, this is this is the point, and it only becomes sort of liquid um, in a crisis. Thank you very much, Caroline, for for your first um, answers to the first set of questions. In the meantime, we have received a couple of others, and let me um, perhaps uh, uh, try to to bring them together. Uh, one of our um, uh, observers in the audience is actually asking um, uh, himself whether it would make sense to also focus a little bit more on the tendencies and developments towards the end of the Habsburg Empire, such as very strong nationalistic tendencies uh, that were basically um, leading uh, towards uh, the end of the empire. And he is further reflecting on whether uh, you could perhaps also think about a further comparison, not only looking at the EU in comparison with the Habsburg Empire, but to which degree also a comparison with other empires would make sense, such as the Byzantine Empire or even the Roman Empire, yeah. um, and uh, to, to get a broader, so to speak, perspective on, on the EU as what you call uh, a benign empire. And then there we have a second um, reflection here uh, from Susana Sanz Caballero, who uh, basically regrets that your keynote uh, was on the one hand uh, so interesting, but that it rather ended on a pessimistic note. And she was, she was asking herself whether that was really meant to be so pessimistic uh, or whether you actually have a much more optimistic uh, so to speak, perspective um, about the future of the European um, project. So this is basically uh, a question to to clarify what your perspective is on the <laughs> on the future of the European project. Okay, let me start with that with that question because I don't think I'm pessimistic at all. Um, rather the opposite. I always try to see the to find the light somewhere and. You know, believe me, it's not always um, that easy. Um, but I think the conclusion that we have to live with reality is actually can be very liberating because I have I have some friends who are who are who, who are talking about the European dream all the time, um, and they really. Uh, they have big ideas for how how Europe should should be reorganized that it, so it can function better. And but you know I've been after having covered Europe for more than twenty years, uh, I see very little appetite with member states who take all the decisions here, uh, like it or not. But this is the case. So th they are permanently disappointed. And I don't want to be permanently disappointed. And I think we have no reason to be permanently disappointed. It is only when you expect the wrong things uh, or too much that you, that you get pessimistic. And uh, so, no, my plea, I think, to look more, to, to have a bit more patience with Europe and to accept it more like it is, um, is actually not pessimistic at all. It's rather optimistic because I also indicate that I think it's much stronger than many people think it is. Huh? Um, the question of um, uh, nationalist tendencies at the end of the of the Habsburg Empire, again, what struck me is when the war broke out, many many citizens and the Habsburgers they were they were real bureaucrats. They kept everything, so. Uh, um, the archives are full with notes and reports and letters and postcards uh, from these days. And they clearly reflect that um, people were supporting uh, that war, even though it, it went 
it went very badly right from the beginning almost. Uh, and they wanted uh, to support the emperor and the empire. And many nationalistic leaders, uh, as I said, they were not uh, uh, they were not advocating any exits. You know, the most critical nation uh, really was Hungary, uh, right from the beginning, as it is now. They were the last to leave. <laughs> you know, because they knew they were com they were forever complaining, but they knew at the same time that. Uh, they they had gotten a super deal, you know. They had a veto over over the entire budget and many, many other things. Um, they reorganized uh, the education system and the language laws in their part of the empire. They could do everything they wanted, uh, so they had no interest at all in running away. I mean, they were always forever uh, threatening to do this and and to run away, but they never did. Um, so it's just when everybody, uh, one after another, had jumped overboard that they they basically turned off the light. Um, so no, I think it it was really there's a there's a splendid book by Peter Judson on the Habsburg Empire that is all, all about this as well. And it's um, perhaps um, the person who asked this question should read that book too because it's really instructive. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline de Geuter. And I think I think what we what we learn from from your comparison today, from the lessons that you draw, is that indeed you you give us optimism, if I may say so. Um, uh, the panels yesterday um, were uh, pointing towards a, a European uh, Union in crisis uh, and uh, an ongoing crisis of. Um, democratic backsliding, uh, the rule of law in uh, several member states uh, being uh, in fact overcome and, uh, and actually um, uh, now being replaced uh, by a rule by law. Uh, and uh, we should uh, probably uh, uh, look uh, into what has been said yesterday and then look at what you said today in order to perhaps also see when it comes to worse, how ready are, as you said, how ready would uh, the um, member states, the respective governments uh, in the European Union be uh, to, um, uh, to actually save the European Union uh, from falling. So we take that uh, optimism uh, from, your, from your keynote this morning, and I would like to thank you uh, very much again uh, for for your presentation, for the discussion, and for answering all the questions. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I would like to give the floor now to uh, my two uh, colleagues, uh, Chris Sylvia Kritzinger and Ben Kroom, to take uh, the floor and to actually start um, their reflections on the first set of findings, uh, recommendations uh, coming out of the uh, Reconnect project, uh, which was indeed always uh, meant uh, to be a project about the rule of law and uh, democracy, and in fact, the rule of law and democracy to reconnect, to reconnect uh, citizens with the European Union. So I'm very much uh, looking forward uh, to Sylvia and Ben's uh, reflections, their findings, and recommendations. Thank you, Kolya. <clears throat> Thank you. Also, a very warm welcome from my side to today's uh, conference on the democratic renewal for a more resilient European Union. Ben and myself, we will present you with some empirical findings that we actually uh, found during the Reconnect project. There is much more, so therefore, of course, check out the website, check out different publications that we have produced over the last uh, four years. So we only can give you a small insight of what we did in, over the last four years, and also hopefully with our results that we are going to present you in the next half an hour, actually 20 minutes because we also have Q&A &A session. Uh, with these results, we would like to stimulate a little bit the discussion and also the panel discussion that is going to follow our presentation. 
Um, I will start the presentation and then Ben uh, will take over and just give me a second so that I can share my screen with you uh, where you can then see our um, presentation as well. Okay. This is always the case once you're trying to do something it's not working so but now it should be there hopefully you can see the presentation and i just put it in the full screen mode so please give me a sign in case you don't see this uh, the screen um, so as i said ben and i will present some of our findings stimulated discussions and i will actually start with the citizen perceptions and i'm actually happy that i can start because it really nicely fits into what caroline just said with regards to the citizens' expectations of, um, with regards to what they expect from uh, the European integration process, uh, because this is also something that uh, we have dealt with in the Reconnect project, namely, what do citizens want? What are their expectations? And I just would like to draw your attention to the famous Juncker scenarios uh, in the white paper on the future of Europe, where there were five scenarios all together with one scenario simply saying, okay, let's keep to the status quo, carry on as uh, we did so far, but then also uh, a scenario about nothing but the single market. So going actually back a little bit with regards to European integration, then uh, the scenario of doing less more efficiently, or the scenarios though who, those who want to do more should to be able to do more, but not everybody should move into the same direction. And then actually the final scenario, doing much more together, that is also proposed to the citizens. So this is, as I said before, very nicely fitting to what Caroline presented on citizens' expectations, that they can be very different, and also these scenarios that um, were put forward in the white paper on the future of Europe actually also try to capture that these expectations might differ from one citizen group, the other citizen group, or also differ between one country and another. So. We asked this question about the scenario in the Reconnect project in a survey fielded before and after the European Parliament elections in uh, 29, uh, 2019. This was a panel design, so we asked the people twice, uh, before the election and after the election. And the countries of studies were Germany, France, Denmark, Spain, Hungary, Poland, Italy, as well as Austria. So again, one could um, really nicely connect to some of the findings we heard before. And these were 2,000 respondents, and then afterwards around 1,000 uh, respondents in the post-election survey. In case you would like to look into the data yourself, all the data set and the codebooks are available in the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. So also you have the possibility to look into the Reconnect data in case you wish to do so. But now let me come to the results with regards to the scenario support across countries. And what we see here is that it's not the same. The expectations do differ across the countries. And um, we see that the two southern, or southern member states, Italy and Spain, they prefer, or at least there is a majority in general, uh, that uh, respondents, citizens of those countries prefer doing much more together. While on the other hand, we have citizens in Hungary and Poland, as well as Denmark, who are actually very fine with uh, what is going on, so they prefer the status quo. Then we have the two countries, Germany and Austria, who say that um, it would be nice that uh, doing less but more efficiently. And finally, there is France, which is not really fitting in any of those uh, scenarios because we don't see a certain tendency. Everything seems to be fine somehow uh, for the French citizens. So here you see already um, that there are differences across countries. And if you look a little bit closer into those countries, then you also see that, for example, for the German citizens, it's not conceivable uh, that nothing but this, a single market is a scenario for the future into uh, European integration. Um, um, whereas, on the other hand, the Danish citizens um, do not seem to like the vision of a European federal state. So very different one, differently. And this is also very nicely tied to what Caroline said before, that once we're talking about treaty changes at European level, 
just looking at this data, looking at the different scenarios that people do want in those countries, we can see that there might be major differences across member states when those treaties are going to be negotiated, discussed upon, um, as there is so much heterogeneity across countries, but also within countries, as we can see here. But let, let me now also show you a little bit more about these scenarios. First, we did a lot of analysis, and I just show you a couple of aspects here. Uh, one with uh, regards to the ideological self-positioning. And what we see here is that um, the ideological self-positioning has a lot of impact on which scenarios people do like. So if somebody considers him or herself to be on the left or even at the far left, then you can see that they are much more likely uh, that they would like to move forward in the European integration process. While if somebody considers him or herself as far right or to the right, then uh, they prefer much more likely nothing more than the single market or actually doing less more efficiently. And also the attitude towards Europeanification is an important um, factor to uh, factor in, which is not really surprising here when you look at the result, namely that those who think that the European integration should go much further, they also would like to do more together, whereas those who think that European integration has gone far too, uh, way too far, they would like actually to go back and have only the single market and nothing else. So you see here already, we do have also those differences within the population, making it very difficult to develop the European um, uh, Union further. Now I just would like to come back to a couple of aspects when it comes to EU membership. So if respondents think they have benefited from, me, uh, from being part of the European Union or whether they have not benefited from being part of the European Union. And you see there is very little going on in the sense that there is no tendency for one um, scenario in particular, apart from those probably who say that they see the European integration as something really advantageous for them that they might like uh, doing more uh, together. But of course, then on the other hand, European identity is a very important aspect in the sense that those who actually see themselves already as Europeans that have already developed a European identity, for them also the scenario doing much more together is much more liked than those who are not feeling European or actually think that um, such, a, such a thing that uh, European Union, a European identity is not really um, existing. So you see already, as I mentioned before, lots of differences within and across countries. So the question, of course, is also, do citizens really understand European Union? Do they really know what is going on when it comes to these scenarios? And um, with that, um, in the Reconnect project, we were very much looking into information aspects, into knowledge aspects in, under, uh, in order to understand um, whether citizens really have these strong notions about the European integration process and whether these notions can be a threat to um, the European Union, to the European integration, or whether actually everything is fine. And in that regard, we looked into misinformation or actually more um, more precisely in misinformedness, we were interested in um, analyzing whether uh, people are well informed about the European Union, whether they are misinformed about uh, the um, European Union, or whether they are uninformed about the European Union. And these are different concepts that I would like to present here to you in a very short manner. Because information is not only about accuracy in the sense that I do know something, but the second part of information is also important, namely how confident am I about my information, about my knowledge. And there we have the constellation that um, I'm very well informed and I'm also confident that I'm very well informed and this is the group of the well informed citizens, but it could also be the opposite, namely that I do know that I'm not uh, well informed and I'm in fact also not well informed, which are the uninformed ones. And then we have this other type of citizens where um, we have very little knowledge in, the, in, the ter in terms of accuracy, but nevertheless, those citizens think that they are very well informed, so they have a high confidence in their knowledge, even though their knowledge is misguided, which is not correct, is not accurate. And 
So we do take these different information types in order to see which in impact will this have on um, different scenarios for the European integration. I just provide you here with some information on these knowledge uh, questions. We asked five questions about different EU um, aspects, and there you see already that um, there were certain questions which were easier to answer, like, for example, that the members of the European Parliament are elected by the citizens. 69% of, of our respondents did know that this is correct. Um, then, um, um, for example, if you go down the list, you see that, that the European Commission initiates new laws. Only 29% of the citizens actually knew that this is the correct answer when it comes to um, the law initiating process. So so you can see that certain questions were more easier and certain other questions were more difficult and the accuracy level varies along those questions. If you look, however, on the left hand side of, uh, on the, sorry, on the right hand side of uh, the slide, then you see, however, that the confidence varies quite substantially. So even though if you look into the last question again, that the European Commission initiates new, new laws, even though we know that only 30%, around 30% got this question right, still more than 30% are very confident about the answer that they gave, that they are that their answer that they gave is correct. So you see already here that accuracy and confidence is are not overlapping and can be somehow problematic, leading to this misinformed citizens and then also their implication on EU scenarios. Um, and which implication does this have now here? I guide you through those uh, results. These are multivariate analysis um, results. What we see here is very easy in the sense that citizens that have a high accuracy and who actually are also very confident about this notion, so you have high confidence and high accuracy, are more likely to vote for um, in a hypothetical EU exit referenda to vote remain. However, those citizens that have a low accuracy, but still think that their knowledge is very high, so that they're very confident, they're overconfident, even though they should not be overconfident because they do not have accurate knowledge, they are more likely then to vote leave. And those who are actually not, not having any accurate information, but I also do know that they do not have accurate information. They are simply undecided. They would not know how to vote in a hypothetical EU exit referendum. But this is very important uh, to um, uh, consider that misinformation, so in the sense that people think that they do know a lot, do know a lot but actually do not not know a lot are actually more likely to vote leave and therefore also endanger the European integration process. So probably also uh, following up the pessimistic note a little bit of Caroline before in the sense of saying that the more misinformed voters you have, the more uh, endangered the European integration project might be. I can tell you that at the moment, the misinformed voters are still a minority but that might change and therefore we have to keep a close eye on that. However, I also would like to um, say something uh, additionally pessimistic in the sense that we know from this information that even if we provide more information, even if we educate citizens more, this might not debunk this inaccurate information that citizens, misinformed citizens do hold because these citizens are so confident about the information they do hold, even though it's not inaccurate, that even more uh, information, even more in education might not change their uh, view on um, certain facts of the European Union. So where to go from here? And this is the moment I hand over to Ben, who's hopefully uh, resolving the issues and uh, coming up with more optimistic views on uh, the future scenarios. Ben. Yes, thank you, uh, Sylvia. Um, one practical issue, I guess. Uh, you, you manage the slides or shall I share my screen? I will, I will manage the slides for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, having heard about um, 
how citizens perceive and what they know about the EU. Um, I guess, well, a, a couple of conclusions can be drawn. Um, first of all, there are very mixed, a wide variety of views. Um, and second of all, um, they don't necessarily want more integration. Um, although I think from this research, but also other research that has been done in the Reconnect project, um, we know that um, many of them want more engagement, citizen input, participation and transparency, uh, or indeed, if you like, democracy. Um, so if we move forward, uh, also in terms of slides, yes. Um, and and um, I have the privilege in a way to, um, to give a, a very quick overview of, in a way, the, the, the more uh, uh, policy recommendations um, that have been produced by the Reconnect team um, on um, the issue of democracy in relation, indeed, um, to the rule of law um, and to uh, citizens' uh, wishes. Now, um, I have to say this is truly a, a collective effort um, of the uh, different institutions involved in the project. Uh, it's also been partly even uh, not only a scientific but also a political process where we sometimes had to negotiate or, or exchange views. Um, so uh, not necessarily everyone shares every idea, but I think the overall direction is, is quite clear. And it picks up uh, on a theme that, that we've been discussing already, um, that the EU is an unfulfilled, unstable, unfinished uh, project. And, and here, of course, the focus is very much on democracy. In principle, the way we can look at it is that the EU has a big democratic vocation, um, maybe above all in democratizing um, the relations uh, between states. So we know that a lot of challenges that we face in terms of security, in terms of climate, in terms of health, in terms of crime, in terms of migration, um, they transcend borders. Um, and if individual states handle them, um, then they may well disregard the impact that their decisions have on others. Um, so the EU is an attempt in a way to, 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 to create a, a one roof. I think that those were the words of Caroline de Graaf, the one roof under which we collectively um, try to look for answers. So, so that's maybe the biggest democratic promise, that really the EU offers a way to, democratic, to extend democracy beyond national boundaries. But that promise um, has not been fulfilled. Um, that's not an original conclusion, but I think it's an important conclusion coming out of, 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 of Reconnect. Um, and it, 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 it's lagging in different dimensions. Um, and uh, I would even say that, 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 that the, the, the uploading of new competences to the European level um, sometimes risks even reducing um, the democratic promise rather than uh, meeting it. Um, and so, so in, in Reconnect, we've been looking for ways for what's going on, what can we do, um, and um, uh, what works and what doesn't work. And basically, we have four dimensions on which we can think that the promise may not be fully fulfilled, but at least can be brought closer. Um, and it starts in a way with the, with the European level, the supranational level. Then we look at also the, the democratizing the relations between countries in a more horizontal way. Um, and then there is the question indeed of, of making sure that the members of the European Union are strengthened in their democratic vocation. And then finally, there is the point of engaging citizens. So let me quickly kind of identify a number of uh, proposals that fall under each of these four headings. So let's start with building a democratic union on the, on the next slide. So that's very much about, um, if you like, the European level, the top-down level. Um, and there we focus very much on the relations between the institutions and one proposal that we really would endorse is to um, uh, make the European, well, strengthen the parliamentary nature of the European Parliament by giving it the power to initiate legislation and not, and in that sense, in a way, uh, uh, open up the monopoly of initiating legislation that the Commission holds for now. We think that the Parliament, a true Parliament for which people vote, should also have the formal right to initiate legislation. Another major deficit in the structure of the European institutions, um, and that really has come to light certainly in the, in the sovereign debt crisis uh, of the, 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 the early 2010s, but in a way also is, 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 is urgent in the current times where we've created um, uh, uh, resilience funds, European uh, uh, 
the recovery fund um, which um, allows and gives a budgetary impulse to, to all member states um, is that we, we, we incorporate economic governance in the formal structures that the union has. For now, we see that, that key institutions and, and key arrangements are located out of the, the formal structures that, that secure checks and balances, that secure accountability, and that uh, uh, applies above all to the Eurogroup, which remains a kind of informal uh, uh, collective of ministers of finance from the Euro countries, but doesn't have a formal place and also no formal accountability within the uh, EU structure. The same uh, applies in a way uh, to the European stability, stability mechanism that has, set up, has been set up as a separate treaty outside of um, the EU treaty. Um, and in that sense, also excluding, for instance, the role of the European Parliament, but also other uh, legal checks and balances. And the same, another treaty that has been established in response to the sovereign debt crisis was the fiscal compact, uh, which also constrains um, national governments in uh, uh, having an O2 uh, uh, lax uh, fiscal policy. Um, but again, this is an intergovernmental treaty that member states have agreed between themselves, but it's not subject to the normal procedures of checks and balances and of parliamentary control um, that are part of the formal treaty structure. A final set of proposals. Oh, sorry, uh, one more on the previous slide that you can go back, uh, Sylvia. Um, it's still that, that um, we do urge a reconsideration of the remaining vetoes. So in a number of, of key uh, decision-making domains, uh, foreign policy in particular, but also tax policy, um, and also in, in terms of changing the treaties, um, we can only move as Europe if all countries, not one excluded, agree. Um, and in a way, we think that's problematic from a democratic point of view, because in that way, of course, a very tiny min minority can keep the rest host hostage in moving forward. And um, so there's a big question here about what democracy would require. And we think that, that a serious reconsideration of, of those vetoes is in order. OK, let's move to the second dimension here. Um, and that's indeed more horizontal, less about the European institutions in a top-down way. Um, and more about how can we democratize relations between different member states horizontally. Um, and one way that one aspect that we've zoomed in on is, is very much the involvement of national parliaments and then particularly in, 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 in their relations with um, uh, the Commission, the main executive institution that we have in, in Brussels. Um, and, and the Commission has made it a policy to, to, to engage more closely over the last 10 years with national parliaments. They visit them all quite regularly. Um, but what's very striking is that practices in all 27 member states are very diverse. Sometimes they are very informal meetings and it feels like the commissioner is just like another private visitor or lobbyist uh, visiting the national parliament. And sometimes these are really elaborate, uh, open plenary meetings um, where it feels almost like um, uh, the government is being scrutinized. And um, we don't want and we don't think it's feasible of course to harmonize those practices it's up to the individual national parliaments but they could be more active in, uh, in comparing each other in comparing each other's practices and learning from each other and we would urge uh, a more systematic approach between them um, um, in, in looking for best practices and good standards and how do you organize the scrutiny of commission visits also because what happens in one parliament may be relevant for other parliaments if the commission makes commitments in germany in the bundestag that may be relevant for other countries as well. A similar horizontal practice that we would uh, highlight is uh, the need um, uh, for ongoing debates about what competences can be Europeanized and what competences should be remain national um, in a more deliberative setting. So now we have sometimes contradictory statements or judgments of national constitutional or Supreme Courts um, and the European Court of Justice. Um, and they are kind of in, a, yeah, in, in, they have conflicting points of view on, on economic policy, on EMU, for instance. Um, and these are fought out by the declaration of judgments. What's missing is more open and public and political debate between them, uh, where they deliberate, where they exchange opinions. Um, so in that sense, we would urge an institutionalization of a an EU conference of heads of constitutional and Supreme Courts exactly to deliberate 
between them and to openly in a way show that there are indeed different views of competences of constitutional order in Europe, uh, but they can be discussed and they should be discussed in a public way rather than the, um, uh, communicated by fiat uh, by individ to individual judgments. Let's move on to the, to the third promise. And that's in a way a promise that also has been highlighted, of course, because yesterday, uh, what we have is, of course, that, that uh, a, a very urgent topic that, that, that Reconnect has been looking at is that we have backsliding both in terms of rule of law as well as in, in, in terms of democracy. And complementary, in a way, to the set of, 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 of practices uh, and the recommendations that, that have been issued by, uh, on, along the lines of the rule of law and, 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 and you know, giving effect to the commitment to maintain the rule of law in the European Union, um, we also want to highlight that, that, that this is not just a legal issue. It's not just about the rule of law. It's indeed it's about democracy at large. The two are closely uh, connected, but um, there is something funny in that we look only so much at the rule of law, but we don't really have a corresponding framework to address the concern about democratic backsliding. And also, I think what's important here is that these are not just purely legal issues where you can simply refer to a given norm and say, well, it's not being upheld and we have to do something about it. It's also a political battle. Um, and for that reason, we propose very much to, to, to think about, can we complement the existing EU rule of law framework with something like a, an EU democracy framework? Um, a, a, a policy program that's really committed to, main, to prevent democratic backsliding and to make democracies within the union more resilient. Um, and one, of course, is, is, is to really indeed to observe the elections more closely. Now, there, there are very good fact-finding missions um, uh, uh, of elections being executed by an independent institution like the, the OACE, the Organization for Security and, and, and Peace in, in Europe. Um, so the European Union should not replicate that, but it should do more with those findings. There, there was a very, I think, uh, uh, look, going by the preliminary report, a, a very thorough uh, observation mission, for instance, last month in Hungary. Um, those are reports that really have to be thoroughly discussed also um, in the European institutions. And it should be done not only for Hungary, but actually for, for every member state on a regular basis, because the democracy of one member state is indeed, should indeed be the concern of all member states. A second line of thought that we propose along these lines is, is indeed that the EU, like actually it does externally in countries in the, in the EU neighborhood, um, uh, invest in, in, in a pluralist media, strengthen civil society, strengthen indeed societal opposition and a, a, a flourishing civil society, um, the same may be needed or is indeed needed for some member states sometimes. So um, why not indeed create funds um, to ensure pluralism in media and civil society in member states, certainly when they feel that they are under pressure or where indeed governments may uh, tilt the balance. And the third proposal, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but, but rather an invitation for people to think about what can be done, what, what, is, what are the legitimate roles that Europe can claim in strengthening national democracy, is, um, a third, is an, an Athens Commission on the Quality of Political Discourse. So a lot of democratic political backsliding starts indeed with, with undermining good political deliberation, exchanging arguments, justif justifying policies. Um, these things we can monitor, as scientists even. Um, and we have a fairness committee that, that monitors the quality of, of the rule of law, of, 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 of constitutional orders. Um, but as a parallel to that, um, in particular, Peter de Wilde and, and Anna Gore have uh, developed ideas uh, to also monitor the quality of political discourse. So, um, as I said, this is only a first try, but we do think that if we want to prevent Value backsliding, rule of law backsliding, and democracy backsliding. Um, we need a broader repertoire, and indeed, we need to admit that this is indeed also a political um, issue that should be addressed by political means. So let me then move to the final dimension here, um, and that's of course, and that's I think a quite consistent finding of Reconnect. Um, uh, the European Union 
does not engage citizens enough. And of course, that's not an easy task. Um, but there, is, there are things that can be done, even small steps. Um, and one is indeed uh, that one aspect that we have been looking at, both the team in Lille, but also in Leuven, is to, 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 to equalize, in a way, um, the electoral procedures. So there are still differences in terms of uh, when he, when the conditions under which people are eligible to stand for the European Parliament. Um, there are different age limits, um, uh, different procedures by which you can assure eligibility. Sometimes they depend on being nominated by a party, sometimes not. Uh, we vote on rather diverse days in Europe. Um, some countries have indeed uh, an obligatory uh, 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 vote obligation. Um, but in a way, you can say that, that these these differences, while maybe harmless or, or relatively small scale, they, they do have an effect in the impact and the accessibility of what are in the end European elections. So um, uh, a closer uh, equilibration of, of those policies is, is desirable. We also very much support, uh, 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 endorse um, a proposal that is being on, is on the agenda right now also by the European Parliament to introduce in a way, a second vote for every EU citizen to vote not only for somebody on the national list, but indeed to in introduce uh, or indeed to set aside a limited number of seats in the European Parliament to be elected on transnational lists, so that indeed you can vote for uh, uh, candidates that are not necessarily of your own nationality, and that really, in, a way, in that sense, represent a European face in uh, the European Parliament. Beyond uh, the European Parliament, of course, there's the question about, about yeah, executive power in the EU. And, and there's been an attempt, indeed, to, to create something like a speaking candidate process by which the European party groups would nominate candidates. Um, at the same time, uh, we've been critical about that because, in the end, the way that this procedure was set up, how do we elect the Commission president? Um, at this point, uh, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen. Um, the way it has been defined is that it should be a balance. It's not just a matter of the European Parliament. It should also have support and indeed the commitment of the member states um, in, the, in the European Council. Um, and uh, so we've been critical of the, of the speech and candidate process. And um, indeed, of course, in 2019, Ursula von der Leyen was not a speech and candidate. She was not nominated by the EP party groups, but the heads of government prevailed in the end. Um, and I don't think anyone wants to have that kind of confusion again. Uh, that's only undermining, indeed, creating false promises um, uh, for the European citizens. Um, rather, indeed, it would be good if two, the two institutions would indeed commit to collectively own uh, the procedure um, and, indeed, on the basis of the outcome of the European elections, create something like a joint um, uh, appointment committee for the new Commission president. Further on, you, of course, you can think of, of even more radical proposals um, uh, which could envisage uh, not necessarily, indeed, the European Council of Commission President being elected either by the European Parliament or by the European Council, um, because that balance is indeed at the heart of the European Union. It's a union of citizens, but also still of member states, and you want to have the political legitimacy from both sides. Um, but, but rather than giving the Commission to one of the two institutions, you could present that by thinking about some form of primary-based direct election, if you want to indeed to, to tighten the relationship between the voters and the Commission. Now, finally, um, and I will be very short about this because I think some people in the in the panel uh, that follows this presentation will discuss about it uh, uh, more extensively. Um, we've been witnessing, of course, experiments with citizen assemblies. Uh, Appointed by lots, uh, random citizens discussing together collective uh, problems. Uh, experiments like that have been going on at the local level, at the national level in, in France, in the Netherlands, in Iceland, um, but now also at the European level, where, uh, as part of indeed of the conference on the future of Europe, there were four citizen panels appointed to discuss issues. And we do think that they have added value. We should not expect them to take over the task of the inst institutions. But they do create a new channel, and particularly they create a new channel to, to, to in a way, to, to break through kind of divisions that are kind of institutionalized in the European Union. 
So you can indeed um, disrupt uh, kind of nationalist divisions that, that are solidified maybe in the European Parliament or indeed in the Council. And then you put citizens together and the agreement may well be bigger than the representatives suggest. And the same goes to some extent, of course, to, with party differences. Some party differences have become solidified in political institutions. Um, but if you allow citizens to openly deliberate on some issues, it may well turn out that um, the differences are not half as big as um, suggested by the elected politicians. So we do think that European citizen assemblies can indeed involve citizens and rich citizens as an experience, but also indeed uh, maybe uh, bridge ideas that have been stuck, have become stuck uh, by the institutions as we have them, and indeed give them uh, an impetus to, to reconsider or to, indeed to consider options that don't necessarily come out of the institutions as we have them. I think that's where I would like to conclude and hand back to Sylvia to, uh, to open the debate and the panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, I will stop sharing um, the screen and would like to invite now all the panelists to switch on their camera uh, so that our participants and the audience can all see us. Okay, here we are. Yeah. I think there are a couple of uh, issues that we just raised now um, in the presentation on the reconnect findings and also the recommendation forward. And I'm looking forward to discuss that uh, further with uh, my panelists or our panelists here. I will moderate the panel and then Ben has will wrap up wrap up the panel afterwards has a very important um, yeah uh, duty at the end of this panel and before we start I would like to introduce very quickly the panelists uh, to you uh, first of all I would like to welcome Tom Toynes from Leiden University he's professor of political theory and European politics and an expert on European legitimacy and democracy so fitting very nicely the topic of today then there is Peter de Wilde a professor in political science at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology uh, he was one uh, of our Reconnect uh, partners uh, responsible for the entire methodology work package uh, too um, then um, I would like to welcome Christine Landfried from the University of Hamburg, Professor in Comparative Politics and currently Thomas Mann Fellow in the United States, uh, being an expert on European integration and closely tied to the Reconnect project over the last four years. I would like to welcome also uh, Claudia Landwehr from the University of Leins, uh, Mainz, Professor of Political Theory and Public Policy, and uh, her focus is very much on what we have just heard from Ben on deliberative democracy, also in taking inequality aspects into account, so looking forward to discuss these aspects uh, then later on in the panel as well. Then um, the, I would like to welcome also Julien, uh, Julien Navarro from the Lille Catholic University, also a Reconnect researcher, being responsible for Work Package 6, and they're uh, very much connected or researching the democratic practices in European multi-level governance also focusing very much on your MEPs, the members of European um, uh, Parliament. And last but not least, Oliver Tribe from the University of Münster, also uh, from the Reconnect project, also responsible for Work Package 9, Professor in Political uh, Science. And he was dealing with experiments on citizens' notions on the future of the European integration, also feeding nicely into what we presented before. Yeah, thank you all for joining us here in uh, this panel and oh, I forgot to mention that Claudia um, Schwarzit could not join us because of some important issues that came up in the last minute. Um, but we have lots of experts here on deliberative democracy that um, we can talk about this aspect nevertheless. So let me join probably um, uh, actually uh, start the panel with um, a general question uh, and I would like to ask you uh, to 
start with a short statement of about uh, three minutes, namely, how would you evaluate our findings that we presented to you and also the recommendations that we actually put forward? Um, how is it actually connected to the research, the findings that you have found in your research? And um, where do you think is the future of European integration going from here? And um, I took the liberty to somehow come up with a list of speakers, and I would like to ask Tom Tynes to start first with his statement. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia, for that very generous introduction. Um, I want to, so my, my lens on this issue has been um, completely taken over by my research project, so I apologize for that. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm working now for, for some time and, and will be for, for several years to come on, on uh, democratic and rule of law backsliding in the European Union. Now, I know that that's, uh, that was ma mainly the topic of Monday's conference, but I think my role here um, is, sorry, Tuesday's uh, opening uh, day of the conference. But my role here, I think, is to try to link those themes uh, to, the, to the work product of, uh, of reconnect in, in line with, uh, with democratic innovations, in line with the presentation um, uh, that, that you and Ben made uh, of your findings. And I think um, the, the way that I want to link those is um, by re-examining uh, these uh, suggestions, these proposals in light of uh, what I think is um, the elephant in, in any room thinking about democracy in Europe, namely that not every member state is a democracy in Europe uh, and not every European member state is uh, a democracy. Um, and that that development is something that we need to um, face with every proposal, uh, with every suggestion for reform, with every democratic innovation. Uh, that we need to think about how that impacts the democracy and rule of law crisis in EU member states, whether it addresses that crisis, whether it distracts from that crisis, and in, in what ways um, different democratic innovations can serve to um, try to bring this crisis to an end. So, for example, um, one of the things that, that our colleagues in public law have been warning against to some degree is the creation uh, of too many new instruments and tools um, to deal with this uh, rule of law and democratic backsliding problem uh, because uh, the creation of new tools at the European level uh, takes a lot of time and distracts uh, away from, uh, from some of the very uh, deep and, and, and severe problems that we see with regard to democracy and the rule of law in Europe. So I share, for example, I share Peter de Wilder's analysis uh, on uh, the, the deeply problematic aspects of, um, of public discourse in some European member states, uh, and that that should be uh, given much more attention uh, than it is. Uh, the Commission has uh, adopted an, a very legalistic and technocratic understanding of, of democracy and how it's responded to democratic backsliding, and that's deeply problematic. At the same time, I'm reticent to endorse uh, the suggestion of the creation of a new commission, of a new institution uh, that would evaluate uh, member state performance on this criterion, because uh, this could, um, if, if uh, well, the, the, the risk is, the worry is that this could distract uh, from the very pressing uh, concerns and the very pressing needs uh, facing European, even the future of, of, of European democracy. Um, so that, that, by means of an example, um, similarly, um, what, what I think is really interesting about the analysis, the reconnect analysis of the Spitzengandidat process for the European Commission president and its failure um, is, is how the way in which the European Commission is set up, um, that the goals has, has never only been um, creating a, an institution which is a successful guardian of the treaties, has uh, democratic legitimacy in all the ways we would want it to and so forth. But the goals of the member states have also been more nefarious. Uh, the goals have also been to create a weak actor uh, who cannot uh, act forcefully against member states when uh, member states uh, are acting in, in ways that the Commission uh, deems 
uh, is against uh, the, the European treaties. The result being uh, indeed at the, in, in the rule of law and democracy uh, corner, that the commission has been a, a singularly weak actor, uh, both in the current commission and in the previous commission with regards to protecting uh, the character of, of democracy and the rule of law in European member states. Right, so, so one, of the, one of the lenses with which I would want to review um, different procedures for selecting, for example, of a commission president is how to solve that problem. Um, not only how to create a more democratically responsive institution itself, but how to, uh, how to create a, an institution that is more independent from member state interests in not um, being uh, held accountable on democracy and the rule of law. The last point I want to make about democratic innovations is a point which is an old fashioned point. It's a point uh, which my, uh, never my direct colleague, but my uh, intellectual heritage colleague in Leida, uh, Peter Mayer warned against, which is about deliberative democracy. So in his book, Ruling the Void and in work before that as well, uh, he warned that this um, charm that deliberative democratic uh, mechanisms and institutions uh, held over uh, some policymakers and political scientists was part and parcel of this uh, hollowing out of European democracy. Right. I'm, I'm uh, greatly favorable for more deliberative institutions, for the inclusion of more citizens' um, participation in democratic politics, but that must not serve as a um, fig leaf for, um, for the hollowing out of European democracy. Right? If we look, for example, in France, uh, we've seen some, some great innovations uh, on the ground in terms of citizens' panels being used, uh, for example, on the climate, and then being completely ignored. Right? We have, uh, with the reaction to the yellow vests, for example, we have also uh, the cahier de dolence, right? so people could, could write their lists of uh, of, of um, complaints to the to the central government in, in every municipal uh, office in France, in every um, in every uh, what's the word uh, in, in every local uh, local uh, council, and uh, those were all collected together in a grand gesture, and then uh, you know it, it was as if they they disappeared at that point. Uh, these these were fig leaf exercises in democratic participation. And, and the result, in my view, uh, is, is, has been catastrophic for the legitimacy of the, of the French government. So we need to really be careful in um, thinking through both the implementation of um, and the possible uh, manipulation of the proposals that we generate, uh, that, that we come up with to try to improve the democratic legitimacy of the European political order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, and I'm sure we are coming back to the aspect of deliberative democracy in some of the statements that will follow. But Peter has already been addressed directly uh, by you, Tom, so I ask Peter now for his uh, statement, please. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Um, it's it's uh, really a pleasure to discuss this issue with uh, you all here, and uh, uh, I thank uh, Sylvia and uh, Ben and Tom and uh, Caroline before for uh, uh, setting up this, uh, the level of debate here and, and the possibility to engage with you on these issues. Um, what I would like to, to bring to your uh, attention uh, now in my, uh, my three minutes is some of the uh, work that uh, I've done together with uh, my colleague Anna Gora within the Reconnect uh, project uh, mapping public sphere debates and what kind of implications that has for um, EU communication. It builds on the premise that a key element of democracy is responsive government. We've heard that also, uh, Tom mentioned it before that uh, there must be some kind of interaction between governors and um, citizens uh, determining what policies to make. And uh, it is important that uh, we take note of what is going on within Brussels policy circles. And it is important that those who work in Brussels policy circles take note of what is going on in the wider public. Communication is essential for this kind of responsiveness to function. Um, so what we did is a map 
Europe's public spheres, who is making what kind of argument about various policies uh, in uh, mostly mass media debates, and, and a kind of elite counter to uh, the survey among citizens that Sylvia presented. Um, and what we find is, first of all, uh, that communication is imperative for EU institutions for the simple reason that they have power. My journalists tend to focus on those in power, tend to provide a platform for those in power, uh, and uh, EU institutions have power, and, and then in, they should not be surprised that the microphone is put in front of them and they have to explain their actions, have to explain their policies. Uh, they better be proactive on this and have an answer ready. Uh, remember that the DG ECFIN, for example, was completely taken by surprise in their new role during the Euro crisis of having to actually take a stance on policy. Uh, this should be uh, clear that the more powerful the EU is, um, the more they will have to answer for what they're doing. That is how uh, media debates function. That also means that the more powerful DGs, for example, where the EU has exclusive competencies, think trade, think uh, monetary uh, union, they should also have uh, the highest um, communication capacity in order to explain what they're doing. The second uh, finding that we, that we found was that um, it's, it's uh, a very diverse uh, debate out there. Uh, all kinds of policy preferences are presented with all kinds of justifications, which makes it very hard for the EU to tell a single story about why the EU is here, what it is for, or where it is headed. That is very much reminiscent of what uh, Caroline mentioned on uh, the, the various diverse understandings that uh, people have, and uh, maybe the best we can hope for is some kind of muddling through. It's also reminiscent of what Sylvia presented in terms of disagreement about preferred scenarios for future integration. Not a single scenario can count on a majority of the population in any single member state that ReConnect studied. Uh, so it's very hard to kind of uh, build a single course of action on that. The conclusion, I think, uh, that follows from this is that rather than pushing a single narrative about this is what the EU is for, uh, this is where we are headed, that's the end goal, uh, we should open up EU institutions and cultivate multiple plural uh, narratives and, and disagreement or discord within EU institutions. Why not, for example, have different commissioners engage each other on what the right kind of policy is in public? Because discord is also a way of engaging citizens. We tend to kind of watch when people are fighting each other. That's uh, unfortunately part of our human nature. So if you want to bring in citizens into Brussels policymaking, show the fight. We have that within the European Parliament, but that's not often uh, the case where the, the most important decisions are made. Show it where the key decisions are made. We want to see those in power fight each other. That is a key element of the spectator part of democracy. Let's cultivate that within the European um, framework. I think that would also help, and I'm uh, returning to the muddling through argument here as a final note, uh, that there's a, there's a risk in presenting the EU and European integration as a political project, as something that we're pushing for and with a, with a certain aim, whether that is ever closer union, uh, federal United States of Europe, or any other aim, rather presented as a political system, a, a place where we engage with each other on determining policy, where disagreements have a chance to be voiced, where um, compromises are reached, and where in the end, nobody gets exactly what they want. Uh, I think that would be a much more uh, a better uh, project for the EU than uh, promising some kind of you know, uh, most competitive economy by 2020 or other lofty goals and, and projects that the EU has presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that provocative thought. Um, we are moving on to uh, Christine Landfried. So if I can ask you for your three-minute statement, please. 
Um, thank you very much, Sylvia, and thank you very much for the invitation to this debate. Uh, I want to start uh, with uh, the point which Caroline de Greuter made. Uh, let us live with the reality in the European Union, which is not pessimistic at all. I understood it as a very optimistic uh, statement, but this reality also means that we have a lot of trust in democratic institutions, and we have a loss of social cohesion in many European member states. So I think this also belongs to the reality. This means that I think also that this conference on the future of Europe is a reaction to this loss of trust into democracy. And I had the chance to be an observer in one of the European citizens panels, this uh, panel on democracy and values and rights and security. And I must say, I was really impressed by the quality of the debates. When it then came to the interaction and debates with the politicians, members of the European Parliament, uh, the citizens were not shy and did not sort of that they did not speak up uh, when their recommendations were formed in a way which they could not accept they protested i was also impressed by that they would say no these are not our recommendations anymore this is what you and the european parliament want we want to change this again and then they would they would find a compromise uh, so i think so far the experience is very promising Though I would agree with Tom uh, that he says, uh, well, we have to wait then how this is put into reality. This is the decisive point. You cannot ask people and let them deliberate. And in the end you say, oh, this is beautiful. We have recommendations. We put them in a book on a shelf and that's it. So of course, if this happens, people will be very disappointed. And then we will have exactly this mechanism of expectations and they are necessarily then disappointed. So I think this should not happen again. There should be a change now. This is not just a new experiment, not just listening to citizens, but also that they have a discourse with politicians, but there must be a real impact on the reality. Now, what was interesting for me when I listened to uh, Silvia Kritzinger and Ben Grum, uh, the recommendations you have formulated on the basis of your research, if you compare this with what the citizens have proposed in the panel I was observing in this panel on democracy, they are very similar. So these citizens are no experts. And it was really, I would go point by point through your proposals, and you would find them in the most of them, not all, but most of them in the recommendations. And uh, one of the recommendations, which was very, uh, very important, was about information about the European Union, which also fits very well what uh, Sylvia has explained that the people who know not a lot are convinced that they know much about the European Union. So here, uh, the citizens were very conscious of that and said, we want to know more. And they made very far reaching recommendations also with a having a European EU convention and treaty changes. And as Caroline de Greuter said, again, you see, you, uh, they tell we want these treaty changes. Everybody knows that this will never happen. So I would, be much more hesitant about that uh, because also an experience in the European, uh, in the history of European integration is most of the countries want to stay in. They have really good things from the European Union. So if it comes to the point that one says, well, uh, we don't want a new European uh, constitution and convention, all that, we have bad experience. I would not be so sure that this does not really happen, but nobody of the politicians is courageous enough really to say we want now a new start. We just go on muddling through. But the citizens, it was one of the recommendations that got most, uh, uh, most votes uh, that there should be a new convention, a new startup of the European Union, and not just muddling through. And I think this wish and these many votes this recommendation had is also belonging to the reality of the European Union. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Very interesting insights. And we continue with the deliberative democracy aspect. And I would like to ask Claudia Landwehr to start her three minute statement. Thank you. Well, um, thank you again for the invitation and for the two um, fascinating talks um, we heard. I'm not sure I can. Um, I actually I don't have so much to say on deliberative democracy, but perhaps um, nonetheless some some useful comments. Um, I think Caroline in her talk has encouraged us to embrace the idea of European democracy as an unfinished project. Um, and I very much share her commitment to what I think is basically what Richard Bellamy calls a political constitutionalism. And I think this is also a very deliberative um, perspective to think about democracy itself actually as an unfinished um, project. Um, the findings from the Reconnect um, project, which um, you presented, Sylvia, um, I think show that um, citizens both within the same country want different things when it comes to European democracy. And also um, when we look at the shares of people wanting more or less integration, um, these vary between countries. So um, we have both within country variation and we have between country variation when it comes to citizens' expectations. Um, and I think not only the between country variation is relevant, but also the within country variation. So because contrary to what some sort of contract theorists tend to think, we do not really have a comprehensive procedural consensus um, and a shared normative conception of democracy within nation states either. Um, so which is why we have to expect ongoing struggles about democratic institutional design um, and while we should embrace um, this kind of political constitutionalism at the nation state level as well. Um, we did a, a survey in Germany and we found four distinct sort of attitudinal patterns um, or conceptions of democracy when it comes to how citizens view democracy. And two of these, which we labeled the trustee model and deliberative proceduralism, they um, seem to me to be more compatible with the ideas of building a democratic union and transnationalizing democracy that Ben has mentioned in his contribution. Um, and this um, is different with the two other conceptions we found, which we labeled anti-pluralist skepticism and populist majoritarianism, which seem to be less compatible with these um, ideas of um, democratizing Europe. Um, and I think it's also relevant that the, um, in my eyes, potentially EU-friendly understandings of democracy and its attitudinal patterns, they are also associated with higher income, higher education, higher trust, uh, higher satisfaction. So I think that overall, the same type of people tend to be trusting and satisfied across levels of government. Um, and it's really important to look at the others, the non-trusting and the non-satisfied ones. Um, and for understanding the, the, the second part, the, the between country variation, um, I think it's important to understand that it's not so much citizens' expectations driving institutional development, but on the contrary, it's mostly institutions and political actors driving the development of citizen expectations. Um, so Alan Rennick and his colleagues at UCL, they recently did a, a survey of British citizens um, which revealed that the strongest support was for the statements, if those in power do a poor job, they can be voted out, and who holds power is decided by free and fair elections. So apparently what Brits want from democracy is accountability and authorization. And by accountability, they do not mean justification. They mean sanctioning leaders who do a bad job. Um, and this expectation, I think, is shaped by the British political system. And it is also what the British national democracy offers, but it's not what the EU offered. So um, coming to the, the where to go from here question, I think that we need to better understand how different forms of democracy that are institutionalized in EU member states, how these shape expectations. And we should also consider how existing EU institutions shape citizen expectations, and especially where they create expectations that cannot be met, um, especially coming back to deliberative democracy, 
looking at all those participatory and deliberative innovations, I think that there is a re real danger that they create expectations for effective and consequential participation, which more often than not are just frustrated and lead to um, higher disappointment and less support for European democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. And we are now uh, switching a little bit perspective, uh, and Julien uh, is talking a little bit about his results for uh, in the Reconnect project. Please, Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sylvia, and uh, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to, to take part in this uh, fascinating discussion. Um, indeed, uh, I would like to um, use my time to share some thoughts on how um, the proposals that came out of uh, Reconnect um, could be perceived uh, by the members of the European Parliament. Um, how these proposals they could fit also with the MEP's uh, understanding of uh, uh, democracy, of uh, the legislative process also as it works today or as it might work in the future. Um, I think the, um, the focus on the European Parliament can be justified by the fact that first it is involved in the Conference on the Future of Europe and in the ongoing development uh, uh, and, and potential reform and also because the EP would have to implement some of the proposals or reforms that uh, we are suggesting now so it's, it's interesting to kind of try to foresee how uh, this might um, be, be taken. Um, Within um, the Reconnect project, um, we have uh, conducted a survey of MEPs. So I want to um, take advantage of this survey to, um, to, um, to see and to look uh, into uh, the MEPs' understanding um, of the legislative process and potential reforms. Um, so just to give a bit of uh, information on this survey, it was conducted a bit more than two, a bit, about two years ago, um, during the first semester of uh, 2020, and um, we um, uh, collected uh, the contributions of 122 MEPs, so that is about one out of six MEP, and uh, with a sample which is representative in terms of uh, countries and party groups. So fairly good uh, representative sample. Um, we asked many different questions. Uh, I will not go uh, through them. That, that is not the, the point today. I just want to, to give a snapshot of um, um, some results that we found relating to uh, the legislative process. Um, so first, um, we uh, asked uh, the MEPs to position themselves uh, regarding the power uh, of the EP itself. And uh, we tested, so to say, three statements relating to um, potential extensions of the powers of the European Parliament. So one statement was the EP should be able to remove individual commissioners from office. So uh, a question of accountability. Um, second statement was the EP should have equal power with the Council in all areas of EU uh, legislation. And um, thirdly, and more directly uh, connecting to one of the proposals Ben has presented earlier, the EP should have the right to initiate legislation. Um, and um, well, uh, I can simply summarize our fighting findings by saying that there is a broad consensus for these three statements uh, within the European Parliament. They uh, about 80% or even more than 80% of the MEPs we interviewed uh, actually uh, say that they agree, so fully agree or to some extent agree with the free statements. And the, the, the level of agreement is even a bit higher for uh, the right uh, to initiate legislation. Um, so we see that obviously the, the, the members of the European Parliament are, are really um, uh, pushing in this direction, I mean, 80%, that means it also includes some more or less uh, your skeptic MEPs, in fact. Um, then we also try to um, analyze more precisely how they uh, assess some of the instruments, innovation in, in the decision making process. Um, uh, and namely, we were interested in how they uh, assess trilogues. Um, early agreements, 
So very technical aspects in the decision making process, but as you know, uh, also key aspects uh, in the recent developments uh, in, in, in the EU decision making process. And we also um, ask them uh, how they see um, the European Citizens Initiative. So, you know, um, we know it didn't produce much that so far, but um, uh, a very interesting development in terms of um, democracy at the EU level. Um, so, there is not so much to say, in fact, uh, in, in, in the, the few minutes that I have on Trilogs, basically, um, they see it as something uh, positive, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, it, it's more interesting to, to focus on early agreements and the European Citizens' Initiative and, and to compare how they see, see these two instruments. Because, in fact, uh, the interesting observation that we, we made is that um, they, there is some kind of trade-off uh, between um, the democratic dimension of these instruments and their efficiency. Uh, early agreements are uh, widely seen as being efficient, like two-thirds of MEPs think it's, yes, it's efficient, but on the other hand, um, a majority thinks that they are not really that democratic. On the other hand, um, looking at European Citizens' Initiative, um, 83%, yeah, I think it's a correct figure, 83% of the MEPs say, yes, it's democratic. So we could think, okay, it's, 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 it's a positive development. But on the other hand, only one third um, of the MEPs say it's, uh, it's actually efficient. So we find here some uh, skepticism uh, regarding um, this um, uh, development. Um, and, and finally, in terms of uh, empirical uh, results that I wanted to, to share with you, we uh, also asked regarding the trilogues um, whether the minutes should be uh, made public, should be released, because as you know, this is one, uh, one key uh, point when it comes to um, the democratic character of trilogues. And actually, um, a majority of MEPs, two thirds, um, think that yes, indeed, they should um, uh, be made public. So my conclusion is that um, uh, when it comes um, to um, making the legislative process more democratic, more transparent, um, well, um, you, you find some uh, high level of support among uh, the MEPs. Um, and in fact, um, MEPs are, seem to be quite open to democratic reforms even if it reduces their own power, um, as we can think with the uh, European Citizen Initiative. So, um, <laughs> to, to, to give some uh, positive thoughts in, in this discussion today, um, well, possibly the, the European Parliament would be an ally in, uh, in our um, endeavour to, uh, to make the EU more transparent and more democratic. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julien. And let's see whether Oliver can follow up on those positive news. Oliver. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you to Sylvia and Ben for um, inviting me to this uh, fascinating panel. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, question of how we can ensure that whatever reforms we are going to or try to implement uh, uh, how we try to modernize the EU uh, will find a uh, kind of support among a sufficient uh, number of citizens uh, across the EU member states. Um, and I want to talk uh, about this against the background of kind of the, the relationship between citizen support and kind of the, the, the fundamental conflict um, between um, Eurosceptics and Europhiles. Um, I think Sylvia already touched upon that uh, in her presentation. Um, so those people who basically dream of a European uh, federal state and those who think that uh, the nation state has already given up too much powers and they want to kind of uh, renationalize certain things. Um, so how does this fundamental conflict uh, in the EU um, relate to those reforms. Um, and I think uh, there are some results that I can draw upon uh, that throw some light uh, on this. Uh, very briefly, um, I think these two groups um, are, so when we look at surveys, uh, we can see that uh, those two groups are about uh, equal uh, in size. 
about 25 to 30 percent belong to those uh, really wanting to push uh, integration forward, um, about 25 uh, uh, to 30 percent generally um, support the more nationalist kind of um, defensive view and everybody else, so 40 to uh, 50 percent uh, is either happy with the status quo or doesn't really care too much about these uh, questions. Um, so um, what I'm going to show to you today is that um, uh, if uh, this fundamental conflict between these two extreme groups is actually activated by a certain reform, there is not, uh, not really a high chance that we are going to find a um, sustainable way of getting that um, supported by citizens. So there will be a lot of conflict and uh, that's perhaps not now, not the easiest way of doing EU reforms, um, but there are also other types of reforms that uh, do not touch upon this conflict. And uh, to me, these uh, seem to be uh, sort of the sweet spot uh, of our current reform debates. So perhaps we could learn something from uh, exploring those um, options. Now, um, there are some empirical results uh, that I, I promised to you, um, and they stem from uh, another survey that we have done in the context of the Reconnect project, um, also in the context of Work Package 9, uh, but we did uh, uh, together with, I did together with my colleagues in Münster, um, I did a survey um, on EU reform preferences of citizens. Um, also in, in, in six uh, EU member states. Um, and what we did there um, was uh, a kind of an experimental uh, method um, called conjoint analysis, where we basically presented respondents with two uh, with pairs of uh, EU decisions, uh, uh, basically having different types of characteristics and also having different institutional um, settings uh, through which they, they came about. And then we asked uh, respondents which one they supported more than the other. And from the results, we can basically draw conclusions about uh, the, the kind of the role of different types of reforms uh, on citizen support. Um, now, what are the results? Um, perhaps uh, uh, with a little surprise, uh, we found that everything that relates to what we call the authority dimension of uh, EU politics, so basically the, the vertical distribution of power between member states and the EU, uh, was highly uh, controversial between pro-integrationists uh, and uh, Eurosceptics. Um, so things like uh, more or less unanimity in the council, uh, more or less uh, legislative competencies for the EU, uh, or also more, more or less flexibility in applying EU legislation, um, that, that, that was basically um, highly contested. And so basically what, what the respondents could agree on was more or less the status quo. So um, those were not very promising findings for, for many of the pressing reforms that uh, some political actors also have voiced. Um, but there is also a different uh, kind of a second uh, branch of reforms that do not seem to be contested by uh, uh, the, between Eurosceptics and Europhiles. Um, and uh, the most important of those uh, was actually a more citizen, direct citizen involvement in EU decision making. So that was basically. Um, um, supported not only by, by kind of the, the middle ground uh, citizens, but also by many Eurosceptics and of course also uh, Europhiles. Um, so uh, basically what, what this tells us is that um, many citizens uh, want more than just be represented by indirectly by uh, their government in EU decision making. They also want more than just be represented by, the, by an MEP that they're able to vote for uh, every five years and then basically never hear anything uh, about uh, him or her uh, in the meantime. Um, but they also really want to have more direct say there. Uh, and that's also the background uh, of why the, pro uh, why the project um, as a whole uh, proposed 
to uh, maybe implement a permanent um, citizen assembly at the European level. Um, now it's of course up to debates how this could be done uh, and what the kind of the tasks of this citizen assembly should be. Um, but I think it's easy, uh, it, it can be easily imagined that, uh, for example, they debate the policy priorities that uh, the EU uh, sets itself for the next whatever uh, legislative term every, other, every five years, that they debate major policy reforms, maybe also institutional reforms, but um, uh, permanent citizen assembly uh, at least is something that is in line uh, with, uh, with many citizens' um, views. So uh, there are also other dimensions, more transparency, uh, also uh, kind of output legitimacy. So that kind of the EU solves problems was also something that uh, even Eurosceptics um, basically supported. So we shouldn't forget that the EU was invented as kind of a problem solving uh, a mechanism and apparently many citizens still think that this is something that should continue uh, uh, and that it's basically a forum for solving problems that we cannot solve uh, alone as nation states. Um, okay, so that, that was basically my, uh, my statement. Um, so uh, maybe we should explore more of those kind of uh, um, uh, reforms that democratize the EU and try to avoid that this completely um, uh, kind of switches the balance of powers between the member states and the European level. And there seem to be uh, options on the table that would allow for that. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so we actually came back to the citizens' assemblies uh, where Tom started uh, off. Um, I just I also had a look at the uh, Q and A um, box here, and I would like to raise a couple of issues, even though I think some of them have already been, yeah, answered uh, by Claudia and Tom. So uh, one participant, uh, for example, asked exactly about this democratic backsliding in the member states and what institutions in terms of national elections institution um, have to do with that. Um, so I think that has already been nicely addressed by you in the sense of saying, OK, these national institutional setups also in how electoral systems do work and how the political systems do work do then also have uh, impl um, implication on uh, democracy, on the, the notion of democracy and the potential backsliding of democracy in those member states. I don't know whether you would like to add something to that. I look now directly to Tom and Claudia on that because they were talking about that. So. Um, if you would like to add something, please let me know. Doesn't seem to be the case. Um, then I have one additional aspect that uh, was also raised by uh, one of the participants saying that we have, of course, those different scenarios uh, that were uh, raised in uh, the presentation before. And one of those uh, scenarios talked about simply having or moving back to the internal market. And the question, of course, is whether something like that is possible to do as now we are going way beyond the internal market. We are talking about asylum, justice, equality, and so on. So is it actually something that could be a possible scenario? Or is it actually a scenario which is out of the way anyhow? So probably going back to what Caroline mentioned before in her um, presentation in the sense of saying it's something that uh, might be possible in from a pessimistic perspective that we move back into one way. And I would like uh, to somehow ask the question whether this is actually something that our panelists envisage as a potential outcome, as a potential scenario um, of uh, the future developments. Christine, please. Um, thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, I don't think we can go to uh, having just the single market because the reality, if we stick and saying, first of all, let's look to the reality, what we have reached in the European Union is far beyond that. So I don't think that this would be a way uh, of a realistic view on the European Union. We have so many fields uh, where we have been also successful. We should not forget that the European Union 
has also very successful uh, things done uh, in many areas. So going back to the single market, I don't think that this is a real option. Thank you very much. I have another question in the Q&A uh, box. And we have talked now a lot about the citizen assemblies. And I think also Oliver mentioned that uh, it could, for example, be a very good instrument uh, for discussing policy reforms. So more a far-fetched or a long-term uh, involvement. But um, uh, one of our participants, Constantin, actually asked whether, um, uh, whether citizens can uh, be involved also in a more daily decision making uh, process or whether this is something that probably um, uh, is something not uh, conceivable also how what Tom uh, mentioned before that this might simply not be possible on uh, on a daily basis so Tom if I may ask you to jump in on this question, whether something like daily involvement of citizens in EU decision making is something that we should aim for, um, or whether that might not be an ideal scenario. Sorry for pointing. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so I think it's absolutely an, an ideal which is worth exploring and trying to give shape to. Um, one, one way that sometimes in political theorists they, they express uh, a dis when, we're, when we're thinking about future kind of arrangements, right? One way the political theorists sometimes describe um, a, a tension is, is between non ideal and ideal theorizing, right? So, ideal theoretically, if we're thinking of like how on the best standards, uh, if we were to, to plan uh, what an ideal supranational community of, of states would look like democratically. Uh, I, I think absolutely that citizen involvement uh, in uh, legislation and policy making uh, as, as feedback mechanisms, but also as, as generative mechanisms for different legislation. This is an, an incredibly um, interesting and fruitful um, realm of, of institutional thinking, one that's been overlooked traditionally. Um, Non-ideal theoretically, right? We're looking at how, uh, what we need to do uh, to improve the situation as it is now. The situation as it is now, in my view, is one of deep, uh, pervasive, and now quite long-term crisis. So then in that context, the question is, okay, well, um, what role can citizens have and what role can citizens be given that, will, uh, that we can reasonably expect will address some of that crisis, some of that, um, some of that existential crisis, if you will, um, rather than creating yet another avenue for um, politicians and, and uh, member states to distract away from that crisis when it suits their needs. So I think that's, that's really the, the worry that I, that I opened with, and, and that's something that I would, would like to um, I, I think it's important to think about that. So even, even when we have an ideal in mind, um, which is some, kind of an end state ideal, that might not yet give us very concrete uh, transitional um, guidance on what to do in the here and now. I think this question has raised a lot of ideas because now I have Claudia, Oliver and Peter wanting to jump in on this uh, question. So Claudia, please go ahead. Yes, um, I actually think the idea of involving citizens on a daily basis is unrealistic. Um, and I think that um, conducting democratic theory as ideal theory is basically pointless. So I think we have to understand representation as an important element of what makes democracy possible today. Um, and I think um, because Oliver Tribe was speaking about sweet spots and was saying that more direct citizen participation is one of those sweet, sweet spots for institutional innovation, I actually think that this kind of participatory innovation is actually the, the kind of innovation that's bound to frustrate citizens. Um, and um, I think the reason why deliberative democracy is so popular among political elites, also in Europe, European political elites, is that deliberative participation doesn't hurt anyone. And innovations that do not hurt anyone are innovations that do not change power structures. So um, 
I think, well, it, it sort of, um, it might be a good way of um, educating citizens of um, sort of perhaps inspiring like a European spirit, but it's not really a way of um, giving citizens an opportunity for effective self-government. Um, and in a way, um, these deliberative innovations, in my eyes, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, especially at the European level, are sort of like opium for the people. So giving them an impression of actively participating, but um, it's actually a very ineffective way. So I'm sort of skeptical there. Thank you. Opium for the people. I will take away that one um, and uh, ask Oliver to jump in. Um, yeah, I also wanted to say that that I think it's it's like the, the everyday uh, involvement seems unrealistic uh, because I mean the idea is that we have ordinary citizens who have other things to do usually. Uh, uh, we don't want to create another economic and social committee or something like that that is basically then you know permanently uh, discussing all kinds of things uh, and, and basically it becomes part of, of the system. So my understanding of the citizen assembly is something uh, is that it comes together for important uh, moments, not to do mainly with the constitutional uh, setup of the EU, but with policy uh, decisions. Uh, and so there, there could be some, uh, some uh, debate. Uh, I actually, it could be that, uh, that this creates uh, expectations that are frustrated, um, but uh, I think um, it, it would also be worth uh, exploring this opportunity at least, uh, because we, we don't really know how it would work. Uh, if it's just a fig leaf, then of course, it's, I wouldn't support it, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether that's the only outcome uh, conceivable. So yeah, um, wait and see. Okay, we have a tendency of not too much involvement on a daily basis. Peter, please. Thanks. I, I want to uh, broaden this a bit to the general question of whether we should have uh, institutional change. Uh, and, and for example, by bringing in citizens on a daily basis. And I think the, the temptation, of course, is to bring in suggestions for institutional change because you know, in the words of, of, of Tom, we're in a perpetual crisis. You know, something's got to give. We, we, need, we need something to improve. Uh, but we've been arguing a lot that um, there's also a main risk in institutional change. First, first of all, to raise uh, expectations that can't be delivered. Um, uh, second, it could be a, a kind of a, a hiding spot, right? That the commission says, well, uh, we can't do anything because we don't have the institutions and the uh, member states aren't willing to give uh, us the powers we need, where the Reconnect Consortium has made a powerful statement saying, no, you already have what you need, and now it's just a question of using it. Um, so this is, I think this is a, is, is a major uh, trade of should we Should we argue for institutional change? Uh, there's a third thing that I forgot to mention. And there's the risk that it only tends to appeal to a very select elite group of political scientists and lawyers interested in tinkering with institutions and uh, the larger public uh, is not really that interested in constitutional questions. So how to deal with this? Um, I think there are uh, possibilities. And that's why, why we pitched this idea of this Athens Commission which isn't really about bringing in citizens directly into the, into the policy formulation, but it is about um, broadening the EU's perspective on what it is, what is democracy and where are the problems with democracy. It's not just with the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary uh, or even formal elections. It's a much more uh, intangible, uh, informal factor of, of basic civility, of civility of how we talk to each other that uh, politics has become too much like war, where we try to destroy, kill the opposition instead of like a sports match, where we try to defeat them. And uh, if we lose, we shake hands and uh, congratulate the winner and move on with the knowledge that there'll be a rematch later. We need politics to become more like sports again and less like war, basically. So, how to bring that in? Well, there, there's lots of opportunities to think about um, monitoring and the, the power of numbers that we have in informal steering without directly bringing in citizens into the policy formulation processes. Think back about 
how we discussed the corona crisis at its height, that it basically at some point became a race between countries to reach high levels of vaccination. The minute you start publishing numbers of the percentage of the population that is vaccinated in different countries, journalists and citizens will jump on this and start comparing it. Hey, we're doing better than the neighbors, but you know these guys have even a higher number of uh, uh, vaccinated people. It becomes a race to the top of what is the most vaccinated uh, country. We can do something similar with public debate and citizen involvement. You know, what is the what is the member state with the best level of public debate, the most sports-like debate and the least warlike debate and have uh, the kind of informal steering in the same way that the percentages of vaccinated people put pressure on governments to do better, uh, have you know, publicized percentages or, or rates of uh, quality of deliberation force governments to do better. Interesting analogy. Christina, please. Uh, I think a, a daily involvement of citizens, a continuous involvement, does make sense on the local level. We have already examples. So here, I think, to have these citizens' assemblies does make sense. It would not make sense on the European level. There we can have it from time to time. Uh, I would want to contradict Claudia Landwehr. I don't think uh, that this does not, in fact, having these citizens' assemblies, uh, the power structure of the European Union. What we can observe at the moment that the recommendations which are on the table and what you can see are very similar to what Reconnect has developed. And these have developed these recommendations. People who are not experts on the European Union, they cannot be put aside anymore. I'm sure of that. Uh, because now you have the first time the interaction with the members of parliament, the European, the national parliament, the commission, the council. Uh, and uh, when in the end, uh, these recommendations now are uh, really there. Uh, you cannot just say without uh, any explanations, without putting some of them into practice, uh, uh, without, you know, without any results. So the power structure, I think, will be changed by this experiment, uh, either in the way that citizens will be so disappointed when nothing happens, that this is really then a danger we will lose even more trust in democratic institutions. So nobody can want this. So I would not, I would not think that the power structure will not be affected by the citizens' participation, which happens just right now. Thank you very much. Caroline, may I ask you um, to somehow <laughs> provide us <laughs> with a with a um, yeah view on what do you think about this discussion? I mean, you've learned now a lot about the different results that we have produced in the Reconnect project of the last uh, four years from different data sources and so on. And you started out your presentation with the citizen expectations in the sense that some citizens think it's too powerful, the other citizens think it's not powerful enough, so um, power, more power should be given. And now you see this kind of heterogeneous um, results that we see uh, across countries and within countries so what would be your final statement on that in the sense of um, what to do with this reconnect findings on citizens expectations and democracy um interesting questions um i think i, I would like to make two points there i think citizens are getting more interesting, interested in European, big European questions. Um, because it is maybe as Peter said, it used to be a little bit sterile and it is slowly getting less sterile. It's, and this is not because uh, all of a sudden council meetings are, um, are filmed or um, European Parliament debates are filmed because actually usually very few people know about this possibility of watching them or actually if, even if they know it, they, they hardly ever use it. What I think changes European politics uh, is that 
the drama has very long, for a very long time been in the member states. You know, it's 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 on the national level that you had the big, or even local level, that you had the big battles between um, the far right and 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 the center, or the center and the far left, or whatever. You know, pirates, uh, political groups, and so on. Even people like Marine Le Pen, uh, uh, Matteo Salvini, they were all fighting on a national level. Uh, partly as a result of Brexit, um, I think they changed their minds, but it's also our environment. As Carl Bildt once said, we were surrounded by friends uh, who all wanted to be like us, or you know, we wanted to believe that too. Uh, very eagerly, um, but well, they seem to have changed their minds, you know. Um, we have to protect our borders. Uh, it's a dangerous world. Well, the rest, we all know. So um, they don't want exits any longer. They want to, to jump on, 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 on the European podium and change Europe from the inside, which can be much more dangerous in the end. But in a way, um, so they, they, they try to make European connections, set up a party, they may fail, they may not fail, I don't know, there are lots of things dividing them too, but all of a sudden, um, I can't remember who said this once, but it's like the opposition has arrived in Europe, which makes European politics more interesting, you, you, you know, you don't have, you don't need to have two commissioners fighting, uh, if you can have uh, Salvini playing the local card uh, in the morning and the European card in the afternoon, you know, something is happening there. And you saw it with the last European elections where for the first time ever, turnout didn't go down, but actually went up. Uh, I forgot how much, but around 10% it was. Second, I think also Euro European citizens are, for a long time we saw democracy as a, um, as a goal. Um, and we, when we started in the 1950s with, with European integration, we all uh, tried to become better citizens and, 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 and reach that goal. Huh? And I think we did become better citizens over time. We, we, you know, we just fight with words and not with munition anymore, which I think is great progress. And let's keep it that way. More sports than war, indeed. Um, but in the in the recent past, a lot of citizens have lost trust in democracy because they said, "Okay, if we don't reach the goal, then maybe the goal was wrong." And I think we have to look at democracy. And maybe I have the impression many people are starting to understand this: that democracy is a process to keep the balance, not only in Europe but in any society, a bigger one, a smaller one. And uh, a balance changes, of course, because populations change. New groups uh, become vocal and grow and others shrink and disappear altogether. You see this in politics on every um, level. So the balance is upset every time. So you, you never get there, whatever your goal is. The, the, uh, I think the goal is much more, more modest. It's not like a plateau that you reach and you know we have really happily live ever after. It's, it's permanent work on every level. Um, and maybe also dealing with a war in Ukraine, which is hardly ever mentioned uh, this afternoon, but I mean, this has a profound impact on 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 how Europe Europe will will um, evolve, because it means that we get a source of security over everything. Huh? And Europe, the EU, um, transforms itself all the time. So this is yet going to be a new transformation. It does something to our to our heads, you know. <laughs> Who is in, who is out? It's, um, I don't think the EU, its workings will not change, but our thinking about it uh, and our also thinking about us as parts of the EU, that will change. 
So let me make, so democracy is a process which requires daily work. Let me leave it there. <laughs> democracy is a process as an unfinished project, as was mentioned mm. before. I think this is also providing us lots of work in the future, but I would like to hand over to Ben at this stage, who has the very difficult job now to make a wrap up of this afternoon. And um, so Ben, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, again, uh, the work is partly already done for me. I think Caroline's statements were, were very instructive there. Um, but, but indeed, I, I also had kind of five, five just final thoughts Kind of emerging from this discussion, partly concluding, but also partly, of course, opening new questions and further debate and further research, because research doesn't stop after that connect. Um, and, and indeed, the first thought is indeed that we have to live with indeterminacy. Um, and it's at two levels. Uh, the European Union, European Union is inherently an unstable, indeterminate, open-ended, unfinished project. And I don't think we wanted to finish. I mean, actually, I think that <laughs> it's actually quite. Uh, uh, I mean, um, and, and I think that also reflects on democracy. Democracy is uh, inherently an open-ended, indeterminate. I mean, you read Claude Lefort uh, on this. Um, it, it's inherently an, an open-ended uh, uh, process. That also makes it risky. It also makes it vulnerable and fragile. Um, but I think the first thing is indeed that we start and learn to live with it. Um, the second thing is indeed that, 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 that there is this overarching concern about bringing the citizens in. Um, and that somehow the EU is still challenged um, in that respect. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and particularly so, I would say indeed, in, in, in bringing those citizens that, that we risk to lose, the people who are distrustful, Claudia mentioned them, people who don't care, don't know for whom it's too distant. Um, I mean, I think it's also even striking if you look at the citizens' assemblies, and I will say a bit about them shortly, there is in the end a tendency for the usual suspects to use your kind of higher educated, young, bright people to kind of come forward. Um, but, but we also, even there, there's self-selection. And I think that when we talk about Europe as a given, as a regime, as a polity, as a fact of life, um, under which we all live, um, and in that sense, there's no stepping out, I think, for most of us. Um, uh, so it affects everyone, but we know that indeed a lot of people are tuned off. Um, and that should be, I think, a, a constant source of concern. Now, certainly, I, I want to say something about the citizen assemblies. Um, and I think, I mean, I think this, the, actually, I have to say, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical about it um, as, a, as, as a solution. But at the same time, I think there's a strategic moment here. I think it's um, it would be a waste to simply say, well, there's political momentum, people are experimenting with it. Of course, it's not working perfectly. And I think, uh, actually, if you look at what's happening in this conference on the future of Europe, it's a, a big disappointment on, on many levels. Um, and it's easy to dismiss that it, this was nothing that, but a fig leaf and a nice excursion for 400 citizens or 800 citizens. Uh, but that's about it. It's as good as Erasmus scheme rather than a political uh, uh, game changer. Um, still, I do think that um, Europe should embrace opportunities as they come. Um, and it's not just a distraction. I think there is more to be done. And um, we have to, indeed, I think it's an intellectual challenge to think about how can we do this better? How can we learn from this? How can we make these things more successful? And um, I do think, indeed, that, that, that citizens can play a role in uh, communicating across boundaries. Indeed, having this kind of idea of a mini public, that there are people across Europe talking to each other and discussing things um, with an open mind um, can contribute, even if it's not going to solve uh, the whole democratic malaise in Europe, in one go. Now then, um, the elephant in the room that, that keeps coming back, Tom, uh, which is, uh, of course, still, uh, what do we do with Hungary? Let's just put it on the name, I mean, uh, give it a name. Um, and of course, you have two extremes. One is indeed, I think, to say, well, it's not of our business, it's national competence. Uh, legally, we kind of cop out of the issue and say, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, the EU is a kind of international organization and Hungary is out there and we cannot interfere in its domestic affairs. But I, I simply don't think that's sustainable, even not on the legal ground. I mean, democracy is a core value. Um, um, and indeed, if, if, if one country really has 
uh, moved beyond the pill. And I think there's many reasons to believe that Hungary has moved uh, beyond that critical threshold. Then it affects the collective decision-making body. So, so something has to uh, happen there. At the same time, I, I'm not sure that simply saying, well, it's just a matter of putting somebody in charge, making a strong commission, just deal with it and address it and punish them uh, top down. I don't think that's the way that Europe works. And they, again, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm skeptical enough of politics that I'm not sure that we want to have that much power concentrated at one level in Europe. Um, okay, one time it's going to be used for the good cause, but the next time it may be used for, for worse causes. So I think that what we very pragmatically and maybe too modestly we've been pushing, particularly in this lag, I think the, the rule of law lag in the Reconnect project is a bit more activist than this. But I think what we've mostly been looking is how can we politicize this? How can we make politicians responsible for it? How can we make sure that it's on the agenda and not indeed sidelined um, secondary issues? How can we keep the full spotlight that this is a serious concern and that we have to discuss about it in Europe um, and that indeed what happens in Hungary, in Poland or indeed in France or in the Netherlands is a concern of all 27. And that brings me to the final point and that's about the transnationalization. I think if we talk about Europe being a fact of life right now for everyone living in there, it's, um, it's, it's also striking, I think, to what extent we're co-involved in each other's politics. We've talked in Reconnect a lot about Greece, we've talked about Hungary, uh, but indeed, let's make this very topical. I mean, when I hear the Bundeskanzler yesterday make a very non-committal statement on Ukraine, it, it touches me. It's also, in a way, he's also my Bundeskanzler, even if I couldn't vote for him. Um, but if I, uh, so in that sense, the, the solution to Ukraine is not only coming from Brussels, it also has to do with the engagement that we have across boundaries with each other's politics. Um, and if uh, the German government doesn't act, uh, and I know the Dutch government easily hides behind it, uh, so that's, that's easy enough, but, but it just shows how deeply interconnected we are. Um, so, um, so indeed, uh, the, the collective chance that we face now most urgently in the, 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 the invasion of Ukraine um, is not something that is left to, you, to Brussels, it's something that collectively uh, we also have to do by engaging with each other across boundaries um, and caring about the decisions that are taken by each and every government. And then finally, of course, make it even more topical, something is happening in France on Sunday, um, for which I would also uh, want to vote, or at least I have a stake in that. I'm not voting. I can't vote. But it just shows, indeed, I think, how closely related we are um, and that political decisions across all European countries affect us directly and indeed that it's a, an ended, unended process, an unclosed process, a risky process, but one that we can only face and I hope we can face it with good ideas and a healthy dose of optimism. I think this is a you, you very... <laughs> I think these are very nice final words and therefore the only thing that I can see at this stage, uh, we're only 10 minutes late and uh, thank you very much for all for all the interest in this discussion for all the important statements that you made and also for the optimistic notes Ken, that you actually ended this panel with and um, you mentioned it before there is lots of research still waiting for us and lots of exchange uh, that is still needed in that respect and will uh, be with us in the next uh, years and years to come. At this stage, I also would only would like to thank you all for your participation, for your statements, and I'm looking forward to continue the conference tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.